Convergence Innovation, Insight Innovation Summit on Digital Transformation as a Catalyst for Growth. Um, my name is Katie Creaser. I'm Senior Vice President at ICR in our technology practice. Um, and we are an integrated communications agency and I have spent my career helping companies to tell the story of their technology. And so I am so thrilled to have such an excellent panel of experts here today to talk about digital transformation and its impact on the business. So how can you get started? What are some of the biggest technology trends that we're looking at? How can you benchmark and look at ROI and return on investment? Um, the panel today will be one hour long. We'll do about a 45 minute discussion and then we'll leave about 15 minutes for Q&A from the audience. Um, we'd like to make this as interactive as possible though. So please feel free to put your questions into the chat um, and then we'll try to answer them as we go. So without further ado, I'll set the stage and read you a little bit of background on what we're hoping to cover today and then we'll introduce our panelists. So as the speed of business continues to rapidly evolve, so do the technologies that help businesses digitize their factories, drive financial and operational impact, and improve productivity and customer satisfaction. Investments in digital technology is having an outsized impact on driving revenue and reducing costs across organizations. So I'm going to introduce our panel of experts, and I'm going to ask you each to just give a little bit of background on yourself and then talk about kind of your holistic or overarching view about digital transformation broadly. So I will start with Jim Hirschhorn, who's a partner at Aries Management. Uh, thanks, Katie, and great to be here today. As uh, Katie mentioned, uh, Jim Hirschhorn, I'm a partner at Aries Management and head up what's called our portfolio management group. My team uh, partners with the, the incredible portfolio companies that we have, including uh, uh, Convergent, to help uh, maximize growth and value creation uh, across the life cycle of investing from when we uh, diligence uh, a new business that we're looking to invest in uh, all the way through when we uh, over uh, the long run uh, sell the company. Um, over time, what we found is uh, uh, technology and, and more specifically digital transformation is becoming a bigger and bigger part of where uh, there's opportunity to unlock uh, incremental growth and value creation in our portfolio. So I'm really excited to be here today and, and talk about some of the learnings we've had and uh, partner with uh, my, my colleagues, Eric and, uh, and Mike. Thanks, Jim. Um, and next I'll introduce Mike Mathis, who's Executive Vice President at Convergent. Well, good day, everybody. And thanks, Katie. Um, as she mentioned, I'm Executive Vice President and my responsibilities include our strategic initiatives and particularly digital transformation, or vertical markets, and global accounts are included in that. And um, you know, I was one of the early members of Convergent Technologies opening the San Francisco and Los Angeles branches way back in 2002. So I've been I've been present for uh, for not only our evolution over the years, but also watching the uh, the, the market and industry continue to evolve. And excited to talk uh, more about uh, that evolution today. Thanks, Mike. And we also have Eric Unag, uh, who is the Vice President of Innovation and Technology at Convergent. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Katie. Uh, it's great to be with you today. Uh, yeah, so in my role as uh, Vice President of Technology and Innovation, I, I really have had the privilege really in the last 18 months to spend you know, a lot of time with the innovation function of a lot of our largest customers globally, really talking about this exact issue, right? How, how does digital transformation impact um, really a lot of the services and, and systems that we provide, but also how are they thinking about it strategically uh, from, a, from a business a competitive advantage perspective, from an enablement perspective, um, from a customer and employee experience perspective, all of those things, and, and really bringing back to conversion, really how do we think about you know, evolving our business models, our, our services, our capabilities to really accelerate that, to, to drive that transformation in security outcomes, but also to drive that transformation from a, a business outcome perspective as well. So. Look forward to the conversation and uh, thanks for having me on today. Great. So to get started, I think it would be difficult to even start to talk about digital transformation without thinking about the ways that it has changed and how those initiatives have changed for businesses over the last year and a half. So back before the pandemic, when, when companies were thinking about their digital transformation journey, they might have been thinking about it in a very different way. And we kind of experienced this period of, of what I'll call forced digital transformation, 
um, when many industries had no choice but to adopt some of these technologies that they had spent a long time talking about. So Jim, if we could start with you, what are what's changed over the past year and a half in terms of how organizations or your portfolio companies are thinking about innovation and digital transformation? Jim, you're on mute. Sorry about that, Katie. Yeah. Uh, I view the last year, um, uh, there's a little bit of a, maybe a change in mindset and the art of the possible, but it's been more about an acceleration. Uh, so if, I, if you think back to where we were um, you know, 15 months ago, there were, you know, most industries had started to have some form of transformation. Obviously, consumer oriented businesses probably further along uh, in transformation, BB companies, but all uh, based on a lot of the studies I've seen, have seen a meaningful uh, step change prior to uh, the last year. I think what we learned in the last year is that the speed at which you can drive transformation. Uh, the, the, the impact you can drive both internally uh, with your customers, with your suppliers, et cetera, can move at a pace that was unprecedented. And I think companies' willingness to take risks because you're left with no choice uh, and, and also think much bigger about what's possible, uh, hopefully has given a lot of companies conviction and confidence that you can drive much more change, much more rapidly than people thought was possible. And, and of course, you know, the ability to work remotely, um, I, I think has now been proven uh, to be incredibly effective across almost every sector of the economy. And Mike, when you're thinking about who is driving some of those changes, have there been any shifts in, in the folks that are involved with driving innovation across the business or, or internally who's kind of leading the charge? Who are the folks sitting around the table when it comes to the digital transformation conversation? Well, Katie, I, I don't know that there's necessarily been a, a, a shift, but I think the who in the room is that it, from all walks of the organization, but I think different groups have different responsibilities. So without top level leadership buy-in from a strategic and vision perspective, I, I don't think this goes anywhere. I think that really, it's really about the, the leaders of the organization taking, taking the charge to say, this is what we're going to do. And creating that, that vision and then enabling their teams who really now, as we push down into the operational level, are then responsible for look at, looking at what they, uh, to use Jim's, coin Jim's term, the art of the possible. What can we do? Where can we focus on to, to drive additional value to the organization, improve our operation, improve efficiencies? And so now we get into the, the operational elements of it. And then, of course, you've got even right down to the frontline people who are going to be using these systems or engaged in it on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, again, I don't think there's a shift. I think it's just that there's, you know, every part of the organization is going to be involved. They each have different roles along the way. And then Eric, in terms of the, the types of technology that, that, your, that your customers are looking at or some of the technology trends that you're seeing, can you talk about some of the, the biggest, not even just shifts, but like which technologies are emerging um, yeah. the ones that companies are most interested in. I, I think, you know, to, to back up for just a second to Jim's point about, you know, the, the coming out of the pandemic here, I think there, there really is a, a fascinating and unique confluence right now about, you know, 6 billion people on the planet having gone through a simultaneous forced behavioral change, right? I mean, at what point in human history have we, you know, everybody on earth essentially had to change the way that they operate for so, and of course, no one wants pandemic again, but this idea to really break all of these habits on how we do things, rethink how, how work gets done, how we, you know, protect ourselves, protect people, serve our customers, all those kind of things. Just, you know, that urgency and that acceleration at the same time, you have this maturing to your question of these technologies, right? You have IOT, 5G, cloud, you know, AI, edge, all of that really happening at the same time. I mean, you think about what, a, what an incredible alchemy that is for innovation, right? This, this, this step function change in really what is, you know, the art of the possible again, that, you know, I, I can't even begin to recount the number of conversations I've had in the last six months that have started with, we never thought we'd ever do it this way, but now we realize we can, and we're, we're just all in on, on rethinking this process. So, you know, when, it, when, it, when you put those two things together, it really is, I think, the confluence of those two things and the technologies that are having, you know, that impact are driving the, the, the art of the possible there. Again, that cloud, IoT, AI, edge, 
but particularly computer vision. I mean, I, I am particularly personally bullish on computer vision as an enormous enabler for change in organizations. This idea that you know anything we can see, we can turn into data is a really powerful concept. That's a very simple sentence, but when you really reflect on what, what that means to an organization, I, I, I encourage a lot of our um, customer innovation teams to, to, to really adopt the mindset of if you had your CEO or your smartest person, you know, observing, you know, your, your, your most important customer processes or employee processes, what would they be, you know, what would be important to them? How would they track it? How would they trend it? What would they improve? What would they optimize? And largely we're moving into a world right now where any of those things are possible. So computer vision right now for me is one of those truly transformative things that uh, is, is, is really bringing value right now. And it just takes some of that, that, that urgency that Jim was describing and, and the people that Mike referenced to, you know, come together and really start solving these unsolved problems. So, you know, I'll kind of come back to you, Jim, and I, I have two questions for you, but I'll ask my, my first one first. Um, Eric just said that once you've decided on the problem that you're going to solve, right? Step one, and you've mentioned that before in previous conversations too. What does it look like from there in terms of, of next steps? I mean, what is the role of data? What is the what does the process look like once you you know what problem you're going to solve, but you're looking at this huge, massive problem? <laughs> um, and what does that process look like? Yeah, so um, maybe I'll start with a couple of kind of macro uh, uh, frameworks that, uh, that that we try to uh, uh, use as we think about digital transformation. First thing is it is important to think big, but not start big. I think too many companies kind of get bogged down and maybe thinking a little bit narrow because they don't necessarily know the art of the possible for, or for solving. And we'll, we'll get into some specific use cases. If you're solving a very narrow case, you know, I may be good, but not great, but there may be five, 10, 15 other things that are possible, um, you know, based on the data you're gathering um, uh, and, and the capabilities that, that you're building out. So thinking big, starting with a uh, very targeted use case that actually is going to unlock business value at your organization. Because if you really think about what is a digital transformation today, it's, it's really about delivering, you know, the end product or service um, uh, that you're doing. And, and, and you can now transform uh, what, you're, what you're bringing to market, whether it's a, a security solution, um, which is obviously the focus for many of the folks uh, on, uh, on this call, but it could be Boy, with all the data I'm gathering, I could go solve a very different uh, business problem. So start with the business problem. So it's got to be owned uh, by the business, but it is highly cross-functional, right? It takes people that have uh, a wide range of expertise to actually execute uh, on um, a digital transformation uh, initiative. People that bring, you know, the kind of business expertise, but also the financial acumen, the technical acumen, uh, as, as well as kind of linking it all together from a project and program perspective, and in all likelihood, really leveraging capabilities of third-party firms where, where you don't have the capability yourself, or you can go buy it on the outside for, uh, for, less, uh, for less dollars. So it's highly cross-functional. Uh, it's highly focused on the business case. Um, uh, and the key is to be as clear as you can on what impact you're trying to drive and make sure you can measure whether you're delivering that uh, the, against that objective. Yeah, and it sounds like, you know, clearly if you're trying to think big but work quickly, um, Jim, you alluded to the partners that kind of need to be in place. So, so Mike, I'll ask you, how should companies or leadership be approaching partnering with the right uh, technology providers or digital transformation partners uh, to help drive innovation for the business? Well, you know, I think after, after the, the the decision is sort of made on what problem someone wants to solve. Very rarely are you going to find organizations that have all of the capabilities within them to be able to deliver on this. And even if they have some of them, they probably don't have them in the quantity necessary for rapid deployment. And one of the one of the things I point to is um, a client that we worked with who had an ROI on a on a it was they were a retail outlet and they had an ROI on a on an AI type functionality that they wanted to add to their system. And the ROI was, I think, six months. They were going to get their money back in six months. Now, if they had, if they had take, tried to take their maintenance staff and repurpose them to roll this out, it might have taken them several years. And 
you're you're now wasting what what we call your speed to value. How quickly can you get at the value that this is going to going to drive? So you're much better off to go ahead and find the external resources who can ramp up very quickly and get a project like this done. And you are much more much more rapidly you get to that the value from that project, which then allows you to move on to the next thing. As Jim mentioned, you know you dream big, but you start small. So and that's that's really important because now if you can go ahead and show that there was some value, and quite frankly, this client of ours, that happened. They were looking at things again. It was retail. They're looking at things more from a controlling shrinkage perspective. And after they got that going, they realized, boy, this can give us some great data on on our customers and improve our customer experience as well. So now they were able to branch out. Well, you know, if they were going to spend three years just deploying the first element of it, you know, how long would it take to, for them to be able to get at the value that then came after it? So I think partners are really critical. Uh, earlier today, you know, we had uh, we had on some from Forrester Research and, you know, the, she made the exact same same comment that, you know, you want to go look and find the partners that can that can really help you enable to get a, a rapid deployment and get the value quicker. Mike's exactly right. I, we, I just was on a, a different session here a moment ago with uh, some people from NVIDIA and, you know, they, they use the term often around co-innovation, right? And they, you know, clearly NVIDIA has a unique, you know, vantage point in, in the world around, you know, AI and acceleration of those technologies and this you know, the concept of, of really bringing in those, you know, key enabling technologies, those partnerships, and, and driving that innovation to get at the value is, again, going back to that sense of urgency. We, we had another panelist who um, had, had a use case where they have, they're a large electrical distributor, 3 million SKUs, and they're, they're piloting a, a program right now where they're, they're using computer vision technology to measure packages coming in so that they can optimize, you know, the packaging going out. Right, like what is this skew? What does it actually? What does it actually measure? So you don't get that huge box with this little thing inside. And I mean, there there was millions of dollars behind this for this organization and this and this just one little use case. But look, we have people doing this one thing. But they they definitely chose not to you know go after that themselves. How do they solve this problem? It was like let's go out and find you know bring in these partners that can help us just rapidly get this thing off the ground, test it small, and prove that the dollars are there, and then go after this thing with you know with with that sense of urgency. Yeah, and, and chances are, Eric, somebody's already, you know, yeah. they've already invent, invented that wheel and they've refined it too. So instead of the you know, your company internally having to reinvent the, the, the whole process and the idea, it's it's probably out there on the shelf somewhere. And, and, and I've seen, particularly with, you know, kind of data and how sophisticated, the, the, how big the delta is between the data science capabilities you can get on the outside versus inside. Uh, and the ability to kind of leverage AI and ML. Some big companies can build it out themselves, but even many large companies can't access the kind of talent that you know a Google, a Facebook, you know an Amazon you know, would necessarily have on staff. But you can go get that now um, uh, in the outside market. And the key is to know where are you going to drive your source of differentiation long term from the transformation you're trying to drive. That's something that I think is important to own long term. But you may start outside and then get get the value quickly and build the capability internally versus trying to build it all yourself and maybe never even get into uh, the full potential. So we've talked about you know getting to the the problem that you're going to solve. We've talked about the use of data and emerging technology and getting the right partners in place. Um, we did the session yesterday, and one of the questions that kind of came through is. What do you see as some of the barriers or challenges to these types of, of, of projects? And I wanna throw it out to the group because I think it's a worthwhile like, group conversation um, from everyone's perspective in terms of what are those challenges that are frequently encountered and then what can be done to, to overcome them and to push forward with, with critical projects? I'm happy to start and then uh, you guys will get, get us grounded and uh, closer to the sea level. Um, uh, so uh, it starts with culture. You know, the, the, the culture has to be right for uh, an environment to transform and innovate. I, I see um, organizations that make it are open to change, willing to partner, highly collaborative, cross-functionally, you know, focused on driving impact uh, and not worried about who's gonna get credit. It, it's more about what can we do to take the business forward um, um, et cetera, and then a willingness to, to, to 
to be open to failing uh, in an environment where that's accepted. But if you do it, do it fast, uh, mm -hmm. do it with data, learn from it, uh, and, then, uh, and, and then use that failure as a way to move forward in, in other areas. Those are all things that, uh, you know, uh, frankly are a bit table stakes to drive big transformations. Yeah, and if, if you ask, ask me to get a little bit closer to sea level, one of the things that I think about is, is just your data. How is it structured? What are you collecting? And, um, and invariably, it's probably not exactly in the form that you need or you're not getting the information. And we're seeing this ourselves in, internally as we try and transform through things, through various initiatives that often we, haven't, we just haven't thought about the data in the light of how we now want to use it going forward. So, so having resources and thinking about, about aligning the data to now allow us to then utilize the, the, the technologies that are out there is, a, is another important step. And I'll turn it over to Eric. I'm sure he's got more to add to that. Well, yeah, listen, I think, I think just to take it down, you know, below sea level, I think, you know, you talk about culture, you talk about technology, you know, I, th I think those are the, the two elements that for our traditional customer, right, or our traditional buyer or our customer who, who has a security fire life safety function, I, being able to look up and identify those things, right, that are in place and in motion inside of your organization, if, if you really want to drive transformation and security and potentially, you know, drive additional investments into, you know, the technologies and platforms that are enabling for those things, being able to identify where in your organization, you know, digital transformations at work, innovations at work, where is that cultural, you know, underpinning that can help you drive that. And then, you know, pointing to those things that are already in place as well around the technologies. I mean, most organizations don't have to reinvent the wheel around, you know, governance, technology, you know, some of those data structures, et cetera, that, that, that as Jim mentioned earlier, these, these, initiatives are pervasive, right? I mean, this is every organization, every vertical, you know, everywhere on earth right now that's focused on this. And, but being able to look up and, and start to plug into some of those things, particularly in our traditional world, you know, a great practical example of this is just, again, rethinking that, that, that camera as a, as a sensor, right? I mean, I, I've spent my entire life in this industry thinking about the camera as a security device, right? Recording, you know, bad things that might happen. But, but reframing your, 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 your mindset to say, look, this is a visual intelligence device, right? Collecting visual data. Where else in the organization might we use that visual data you know, to, to drive some of these outcomes? How can we be an asset to the organization in other areas? So it goes to both of those things. You know, look for that culture, you know, look for that technology alignment, and then just start to, to, to really move fast and think about those unsolved problems and how you might do things differently. The, the other thing, just as, as we think about digital transformation across our portfolio, there's three elements that we're trying to drive consistently across um, uh, our portfolio companies. And, and in the middle, you know, a lot of our portfolio companies are in the middle market versus, you know, kind of Fortune 50, Fortune 500. Um, one is an enterprise architecture that's aligned, aligning the technology and the capabilities to support the future growth plans. You know, too many companies, the technology is, is really viewed as kind of infrastructure uh, as opposed to a core enabler to support the growth objectives of the business. So there has to be a parallel work stream to ensure that the, the roadmap for all the tech stack in, a, in, a, in an organization is set up to enable the things that you know, Mike and Eric have been talking about. Two is the data science layer. So to Mike's point, you gotta have a data strategy uh, what, what we have learned, though, is uh, uh, trying to have a data strategy for all the data of a company all at the same time is probably it, it, that that's it's a it's a goal that never gets accomplished. Um, so the, the, the question is, what's the data you need to be clean to actually solve the use case that you're going after? That data needs to be in great shape and you need to have a strategy for it. But you also need to be thinking about what, what can I what other sources of data can I pull in to maybe enhance that use case or go to new use cases? And you know, Eric's point, thinking about the uh, you know um, the camera as a sensor. Boy, there's a thousand things you could do with that sensor. You know, beyond you know helping a company reduce it. could be marketing ROI, could be improving store design uh, and layout, and you may need different data for that. And then the last is the AI and ML layer, layer which could be done internally, but there's also third parties that can really help accelerate the time to value. I, I want to just highlight one point Jim made the first one, which is enterprise architecture. I think this is an area 
that's uniquely different for most of our traditional customers right now, right? I mean, th this is a very interesting inflection point where, you know, thinking about long-term technology road mapping and planning that is aligned with that enterprise architecture that Jim's describing is really important right now, right? I mean, the idea of really building this foundation for these transformative capabilities going forward, it, I, I, this is, this is a, a conversation that I'm strongly encouraging, you know, a lot of our most forward-thinking customers to have now around their security function systems and, and, and planning is to really lean into that uh, and, and identify that enterprise architecture strategy because it, it becomes, you know, really an imperative moving forward to have those, those things in alignment and to be able to, to unlock that value over the long term. So I just want to take a second to remind folks that are participating um, that you can ask questions as you go. Believe me, I did the session yesterday with these guys and there's no question that they cannot answer, as you can see. So please feel free to drop your questions in the chat and I'll ask them as we go. But I, I wanna, Eric, kind of talk off of what you mentioned about, about road mapping, but I wanna apply that portion of the conversation to uh, return on investment, setting key milestones for projects, making sure that the large investment that you've made in these projects is measurable and is also delivering against the, the business strategy. So I'd like to pivot if we can for a minute and, and Mike, maybe you could address this first about ROI on digital transformation and, and what that approach should look like. Well, you know, when you start when you start going ahead and prioritizing, I think when you're looking at the different problems, that's certainly one of the areas to look at, right? I mean, the ROI on it and the impact that it's going to have on your business or your customer experience certainly needs to be taken into into account when you're when you're deciding where are you going to go and what are you going to do first. You know, I, I now you might, if you want to get your 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 feet wet with this, you might start on something a little bit smaller. But as Jim said before, you do have to be thinking big and be thinking about where the biggest impact can be. And then it is important to be, to be measuring and understanding the impact that these, that these initiatives are having. We don't wanna be out there implementing and spending money on things that really at the end of the day aren't having a, a, an appreciable impact on the organization. There's really no point in doing that. The one thing I'd, I'd add is um, you know, data really is the new oil. So as, you're, as we're doing use cases, I've seen companies you know, to look at a very narrow use case um, and, and put in a solution that solves that specific use case, but does not have necessarily flexibility to scale nor place value on incremental value on the data that could be captured. And I, and I think, it's, especially in the security world, there's massive amounts of data that have real value to an organization beyond the specific use case uh, that's being solved. Uh, and you know, thinking that through upfront, you may end up having a little bit higher investment uh, on the upfront, particularly to, to, to get more richness in data that could unlock lots of value uh, down the road. And those are important things to at least think about upfront. Yeah, Jim, that's, that's a great point. I think you know, one, of, one of the things that we're starting to see around computer vision particularly is exactly that, right? Like the, the, this idea of, of defining these use cases uh, very intentionally, back to Kay's originally qu original question, like what, what is this use case? What is the value? And then, you know, piloting and, and testing a, a deployment, that, that proof of value concept that look, there's a lot of noise out there in technology, right? You know, we, we've been really intentional lately about really bringing in different technologies to see which one line up to deliver those outcomes. But to your point about data, you know, we're really entering a different era here where, you know, turning all this, you know, transforming all this information into intelligence is probably one of the more practical outputs of digital transformation in the security space. And, you know, when we think about all of that additional context that we bring from a visual perspective, you know, from a physical space perspective, you know, what might those traditional security use case data points mean towards organizational operation, right? Whether that's safe buildings, you know, workplace efficiency, you know, optimizing, you know, new ways to work, um, safe buildings, all, just then, you know, all the operational things behind that. So this idea of connecting the physical to the digital world and not, not sort of just, you know, definitely delivering on the single use case, but thinking broadly about where might this data become useful for the organization does in totality, you know, create a, a, that difference in competitive advantages around those unique data sets, right? That organizations can begin to create and to optimize in ways that, that, that potentially their competitors can't or that organizations that aren't thinking that, that way are able to do going forward. 
Jim, you mentioned before you talked about um, culture being a big part of this process, but I want to I want to kind of dig into that deeper if we can. When you look out across, because of the the breadth of companies that you have access to and that you work with and that you see, what are the elements of culture that make digital trans that make a company innovative? You talked about collaboration earlier, but what are the shared qualities that help to ensure that these projects will be successful? I think about you know, employees that need to adopt new technology and that also may need to be on board with some of the initiatives that are coming down from the top. So what are some of the shared traits? And Eric, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well, Mike, um, but just setting up for success. What does that look like? Yeah, look, I, I think there's uh, I think there's two, two elements. We maybe start culture kind of at the organization level and then we can go down to like the types of people that thrive in a, in a more um, uh, transformational environment. So at the cultural level, we talked about collaboration. We talked about, you know, kind of not wedded in the, we've been successful. So, so we got to keep doing what we've always done because the world is changing and passing us, uh, passing us by. So that openness to change, uh, probably not taking yourself too seriously. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, people get kind of caught up, uh, in, in their, in their own environment. And, and because it is so collaborative, and because ideas may come from all levels of an organization, the organization has to be you know, able to learn and hear and listen um, and adapt to what they're hearing from their customers, but also most importantly from the front line that's interacting uh, you know, day to day uh, with where the, where the value is actually being delivered uh, to, uh, to its customers. And I see a lot of companies you know, kind of miss that. Uh, clearly, you know, we're in a knowledge economy. So people have to be you know, continuously uh, learning. If, if your culture is not one where you're open to reading something and learning, you know, going to a trade show, seeing the art of the possible, looking at competitors, looking at other industries and bringing new, new ideas in, it's going to be tough to innovate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you're not willing to have failure, um, uh, from, and we talked about that, uh, that before, from actually trying something that may not work, but learning from it, uh, things won't work. But you also have to have a laser focus on driving impact because you can get lost in a digital transformation by trying to think about this big thing. And, and you could be in year three, 100, 200 million dollars into a big uh, program and have nothing to show for it. A bias for you know, kind of urgency results and, and impact is what I've seen to be the best, uh, best way to deliver uh, uh, impact. Well, and just to build on that, you know, the results and the impact, Jim, I think, you know, that that just reinforces the decision to go ahead with it, which then fosters the, the continued evolution and expansion of, of digital transformation and looking for, uh, you know, additional opportunities. If you, if you get mired down on that and don't see some early success, it, it just makes it so much harder further down. But, um, but that early success uh, often, you know, launches, launches the program forward. Yep. You know, the thing I would observe, you know, that, that's important culturally is just that focus on people, right? And, and, and this, this, the way I'm going to frame this may sound a little counterintuitive, particularly in our world, right? This technology around particularly the traditional fire security, life safety, oftentimes it is aimed at better outcomes, of course, but in manpower reduction. And it, it, the focus on people comes from you know, the safety of people, safety, security of people and, and safe protection of spaces, et cetera, is a priority, right? And technology becomes, you know, an enabler to that. So it is you know, how you allocate human capital and how you, you know, put your best people doing the most important things and use technology in that process. So I've seen some conflict in this, you know, over time where, you know, the, the, the hesitancy to embrace some disruptive technology comes from, look, here's the paradigm. And I've known, you know, this person forever, and he does this function. And well, what would he do if that didn't exist? And look, rarely have we seen, you know, the ability not to continue to evolve people's, you know, roles and organizations that are valuable and everything else, but also just the, you know, looking up again to place that emphasis on what is the organizational value here, and, and the need to drive these new technologies to, you know, better, you know, serve, you know, organizations, employees and customers over the long haul. You also, it's interesting, you, it's a great point, Eric. Um, you have to think about how the change is going to impact people, right? particularly if it's a transformational um, uh, effort that's going to uh, be inward facing, meaning it's going to transform how we do work internally, how, you, how we drive the change, how we position and communicate 
what is it? We understand this is going to make your work different um, and hopefully better because now you can spend more time, you know, uh, on less monotonous things that can get, you know, automated and more time, you know, on actually adding more value to the, to, to you, whoever your customer uh, is. So that change management is super important. So I have a question that's actually related to this topic from someone who is in our audience. Um, and it says, we've heard in other sessions that companies are too busy and people already have too much on their plate. How can we get started with digital transformation or computer vision if we already feel like we have too much going on? Um, so I'll throw out that question to, to the group here and whoever wants to, to answer it first, but it is related to our last topic a bit. I'll start on that. I think it goes back to some of our prior comments about you know, leading into those in-place initiatives, right? Those, those assets that you already have and, and the partnerships that, that Mike mentioned and, you know, making sure that the, the people around you are, are able to, you know, react to those things. I, I think, you know, Convergence, you know, finds itself in an interesting position now where we're able to help accelerate and prove out the value of some of these things in, in other areas rapidly. So I think, I think that, that partnership aspect of things is key. And that idea of, of, again, looking around the organization and understanding where other innovation uh, activities are, are actively at work and beginning to bring, you know, leverage that, that in, in motion uh, momentum to drive some of those initiatives. And Eric, I'll, I'll, I'll point back to the way back to the beginning when Jim talked a little about top management buy-in from this and support. I mean, if, if, if this isn't an organizational thing, if the organization doesn't see this as important, you're never going to be able to find the, the, the time because they're going to prioritize the other activities that you're doing over top of something like this. And I think, I think that's a very real, a very real concern. So perhaps the reason you, you feel like you don't have any space to, to take on a digital transformation initiative has to do with perhaps a lack of support uh, in, in the leadership to say that that's an important area to focus on. And so, um, how you how you get your leadership to buy in is, um, is maybe that's a, a topic for a different session, or maybe, yeah. maybe Jim has but, some but that, that, it, it's that a great, always like, comes it, up though in digital transformation panels, the, the buy-in portion of it. Yeah, it, it does. But it reminds me of a, of a comment made on the last panel about um, really the, the, the language of the C-suite, right? And when you're talking in terms of dollars, whether that's cost savings or driving revenue, mm -hmm. generally this is you know widely understood, and I, it was it was something that several people, the comments that several people made around, you know, if you can spend just a, a little bit of time trying to just basically frame the cost impact of what this might actually do, you know, drive, whether it's a cost reduction or, you know, uh, process improvement or, or, or revenue implication, that, that 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 goes a long way up the ladder, right? Those, those are the kind of messages that travel when you can get down to these, you know, basic uh, elements of economics that, that some of this technology can quickly get after. And so that was, it was a point made a couple of times, I think is, is, is very relevant because that, that's a message that travels. It's, I'll just get it, maybe give where my investor had for a minute. You know, we look at uh, thousands of businesses to invest in every year across uh, our portfolio and our private equity group. It's, um, it's a very huge number and we'll, we'll transact in uh, probably less than 1% of the businesses that we look at. So it's a pretty, pretty small set. We will not do an investment where we've not assessed the risks and opportunities uh, from digital transformation happening in, their, in that industry. Fundamentally, every company in every industry is going through a digital transformation, like it or not. Uh, whether it's a competitor that's ahead uh, or um, your business that's ahead, it's happening. And the pace, as we talked about in the very beginning, is accelerating. So it's, it, it is, a, it is a, a, for sure, a board level topic. For sure, it's at the top of the radar screen for us as, a, as an investor looking at a business saying, is this going to be a winner or a loser in that space? The second thing is we, we have a process called the mobilization process that most of our companies uh, partner with us to, to go through. And it's really about aligning on, you know, the three to five, maybe six highest value driving, you know, big strategic initiatives in a company. I can't think of um, many companies in our portfolio where the transformational impact of technology to drive acceleration and growth doesn't show up as one of those top six things. And if it's not, it probably means the company's not thinking big enough uh, and may, may not have the, 
ability to start small enough to actually show that the ROI is, is real. When it comes to where you're seeing boards focused or where the, the money is going, um, you know, you see digital transformation in operations, security, marketing, IT. Are there any trends that you're seeing in terms of where folks are focused right now? Like which one of these areas of the business seems to be a priority over others or any trends that you're seeing, Eric, you've talked about security, um, but any, any broad trends that you're seeing, um, Mike? I mean, well, I, I, go ahead, Mike, sorry. Oh, no, no. It, what I was going to say is I, in, instead of diving straight into a broad trend that I see across the what I think the trend is maybe taking one step back and the trend I see is that this is much more vertically market focused than a lot of other applications that we've, we've seen before. So I, I can't comment on a trend because if I look at manufacturing, they have a different set of, of uh, different set of pain points and pressures and areas where they need to focus on versus let's say somebody in, in the, 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 the travel and entertainment business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think the macro trend is understanding that for your vertical market, the space that you're in, the things that are important and where the opportunities are, are going to be different for you. That's that, that that's probably the, the maybe it's more of a macro trend. And and Jim, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, if you go back three, four years, it was much more consumer facing. I, I think I think with COVID, I think companies had to be very internally focused in terms of how technology was going to be used to transform the way work gets done. So now I I, I see um, I see internal transformation. Uh, I see customer transformation. I see how we work with suppliers. Uh, and I see people getting really creative about how to take the data that exists from sensors that, that are out there to both drive improved workflow, but also drive uh, impact with, uh, with, with you know, the customer uh, experience. So I, I, think it's, I think it's accelerating in multiple areas. And, and Jim, you just touched on what, what I was going to highlight. I think the the thing that I've seen accelerating personally in my conversations across verticals is just that emphasis on the customer experience, right? Just, just th this dichotomy between, you know, the optimized online experience and everything that happens in the physical world. And that, this isn't just a retail oriented conversation. It is across industries right on, what does it mean to serve your customers? Even at the enterprise, you know, business to business level, you know, and, and all the things that can be optimized through digital transformation, you know, particularly when it comes to, you know, understanding the, the, the physical world better and optimizing those those components and processes and just the customer experience. And I think there's a, you know, we touched on this earlier with the just the macro shift in the world that happened over pandemic, but those those behavioral expectations, you know, have been cemented in all of our minds on what a customer experience looks like. And I think are being drawn into that, you know, commercial enterprise type experience where that, that, that there's just a, a growing focus in, in my view of what's happening there on what the customer experience looks like going forward. So we're at about 15 minutes left for the panel. So again, I'll just let folks know that if you wanna ask questions, they are open and we're happy to read them out. Um, my next question is if, if you're someone who's kind of looking to the best, if we look at you know verticals or companies that you would rank as best in class or use cases that you've seen that this audience should be aware of for digital transformation. I just want to throw that out to the, the group for a minute. Who, who, who do you admire or what industries are you looking at that are kind of really pushing this forward um, that could almost be case studies or use cases for the rest of, of us? I'll, I'll, I'll throw a, 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 maybe a few examples here and um, I, I I come to conversion by way of acquisition and have a long history in the financial vertical. And, uh, you know, financial vertical is interesting because they both have um, <laughs> an interesting alchemy of, 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 you know, organizational components there. They have obviously high security requirements, you know, they operate online, you know, they're, they're a high risk target cyber, you know, they, they operate a, a large retail network and, and the customer experience is highly important to financial institutions at the retail level. So I, I look at financial as, as a really interesting case study about all of those elements coming together, right? And, you know, we, we we're seeing, you know, interesting and innovative ways that they're bringing these technologies to solve new, new you know, limit those risks, right? Across all those the dimensions that, that financial institutions have always been a target of, but also what that customer experience looks like, right? And we've had some just, 
least in my world, fascinating conversations with some of the largest financial institutions in the world about, you know, what does computer vision mean in the retail branch to, to change, alter the, the, the customer experience, right? Or to, to improve that customer experience. We had, we had a specific uh, financial institution that had, and they didn't disclose them all to us because they viewed these as, you know, part of their competitive advantage in, you know, hundreds of potential computer vision use cases that would, you know, improve that customer experience to the branch, you know, bring some of those, you know, online experiences down to a branch environment and just optimize, create more of that frictionless experience. Again, connecting that behavioral expectation that we've all become used to with that click a box and something shows up at my door. I just look at my phone and I'm in and all of those things that are happening to change the way they do it. So I, I, I look at that, you know, at the financial vertical in particular, and, and we, we have a, we're fortunate to have a broad exposure to that, uh, lots of, of really forward-thinking customers there that they've got a lot of lot of differing elements all together in, in one one industry that um, really to me uh, are, are showcasing some of the things that are possible going forward and lots of innovative thinking. Yeah, I, listen, I think you, you you almost can't ignore the online retailers and and quite frankly, it's because that's all they had was the digital world, right? So I think they, you know they almost had to create it if or or they wouldn't exist. It was it was they, they had no option. But beyond that, I, I, I think instead of pointing to, you know, who's leading the way, I sort of think about uh, about where there's off, where the opportunities are. And boy, they're, they're, they are across so many verticals. Eric mentioned, and I was talking a little bit about it before, and just, you know, another one that, that comes to mind is in the healthcare in, industry where, and I think, you know, Jim, you and I might've been talking because, you know, Aries has a, a healthcare-based company. You talk about the patient experience because directly correlated to to the, the outcome and the opportunity to improve that patient's experience through digital transformation and, and bringing better services to that to the patient is uh, is going to have a direct outcome in, in the health of the patient, which m- might be one of the best measurements that, uh, that that you could come up with, right? So I think there's exciting opportunities in, in many, many different vertical markets. Jim, I don't know if any thoughts you have. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. I was going to go to, uh, I'll share some of the use cases that I'm seeing you know, kind of get pretty high focus uh, right now, um, more so than, because you know, it's across every industry. And uh, of course there's, you know, big tech companies that you can point to, but innovation is happening uh, now much broader than people, uh, people realize. Um, uh, so one is uh, leveraging the gig economy. So can you create a technology that can actually find the right workers for a particular task or job, and it could be a complex, but it also could be, you know, kind of a local service a job. We had a company that literally picked up, believe it or not, they picked up trash uh, at multifamily doorstep, you know, at the doorstep of multifamily apartment complexes. It's a two hour job. Uh, they ring fence properties, and there's a lot of people that actually like to work for two hours. Uh, and, but you can't do that without technology. And we had thousands literally probably 10,000 people that were actually doing that job every day with, you know, almost 100% on-time complete capabilities, all tech-enabled. That business model does not exist without, without technology. Um, uh, um, marketing, uh, top of the funnel. How do you find, you know, uh, customers and customers that look like your best customers to bring in into your business? And then how do you increase the conversion? That's a digital transformation opportunity, whether it's your website, but it's also linking your website, your call center, what's happening in your physical locations. So you're gathering a multi-channel view of your customer base, finding out who are the customers that are most likely to use your service, driving higher share of wallet, but also finding other customers that are likely to look like that. I think what's now happening um, in many, you know, since the onset of, uh, uh, kind of pure online, companies to survive long-term actually have to provide a very compelling multi-channel, omni-channel experience, not just in retail, but also in healthcare. Uh, and you're seeing that in, in, in other consumer businesses. And, and you've got to be able to look not just individually and functionally at the experience a customer has in one channel versus another, but really think about the end-to-end you know, journey and all the touch points and make that differentiated. Because if you don't, uh, then then you're ultimately going to lose share uh, to you know folks who do that uh, much 
uh, much better. And then probably the last big area uh, is internally. You know, uh, robotic process automation, um, uh, automation in, in warehousing, distribution. You know, pretty soon you're going to see grocery stores have um, uh, in the back of, uh, back of the grocery store, it'll be a lights out operation, you know, managing online, um, you know, online uh, grocery pickup and, uh, and, and delivery. And that's going to be all automated. And that technology exists today. So you're going to see some massive disruptive change happening in all industries. And that's why, you know, when, when I say I have a tough time getting going with digital transformation, it, I really encourage this group to be a part of the solution because it's coming and it's coming to every uh, industry and it's coming fast. Yeah. Uh, Jim, I think the, your, your omni-channel comment is a really good one because for this audience, you know, omni-channel really means, you know, that connecting the physical to the digital world, right? I mean, having a seamless experience wherever you are, you know, from an organization perspective in, in, in this context and for the people that, that are in our universe and listening to this conversation, you know, we've got, a, we've all spent our careers really, you know, connecting the physical to the digital world, right? And, and helping to be part of that catalyst and, and looking for those, you know, omni-channel type, type um, engagement opportunities is a really powerful opportunity, whether that's, you know, IoT sensors and edge and, you know, automation, you know, computer vision, et cetera. That's all about omni-channel, right? Bringing all of those, those themes in, into physical space, the ideas around, you know, digital twins and, and, you know, internet of behaviors, all these kind of ideas circle around this idea that we have a same kind of experience, right? That omni-channel experience wherever we are. And look, that's what customers are looking for across a lot of different industries and uh, fascinating changes ahead for sure. So I had a great last question, but we have an audience question that is better than my last question. So we have just a few minutes left. Um, and I'm going to replace my last question with this one. And I'll ask you to just kind of answer um, from your perspective and we'll go one by one. And and um, Jim, I guess we'll start with you. So the question is, what's the one thing that you would recommend now that businesses prepare for that we weren't thinking about one to five years ago? Wow. That's Put everybody question. on the spot with the last hey, thanks for <laughs> Thanks for starting with me. Yeah, yeah you I, got I, it. <laughs> I knew we had a good audience here. Um, uh, look, I, I, uh, I'm not sure it's the, the one thing, but I think this convergence of all the technologies that Eric hit on earlier, whether it's 5G, IoT, data, AI, blockchain, security, and kind of cloud or uh, infrastructure, hyper, those trends are real. They're accelerating. Um, and in five years, the art of the possible, you know, and I think this, uh, this group has, has heard about, um, you know, just the massive step change that's going to come with 5G, which, by the way, we're just at the tip of the iceberg of taking advantage of. It's going to drive a pace of transformation that will make the past year uh, seem actually relatively anemic. Uh, and that's what we need to prepare for. Uh, and to do that, it's really thinking about the knowledge uh, and how we collaborate and work together as a team to solve big problems at speed. You know, I, I think that's exactly right, Jim. I, I, I don't think you can underestimate, you know, the impact of the coalescing of all those technologies and the maturity of those technologies on what's going to happen here. I mean, you put it in the context of that fourth industrial revolution and, you know, a, a change in humanity on par with electricity and the mechanization of manufacturing. I mean, that's what we're talking about here, fundamentally altering the way the world operates. Now people relate to one another. I think the one, one thing that I would offer to, the, to particularly this audience is really rethinking you know, your, 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 your camera, you know, investments in that visual intelligence infrastructure framework, right? That you, you, you broaden your, your use case and your thinking to be, look, yes, we can fundamentally improve security, but begin to think about that as investments in visual intelligence infrastructure that, that will bring totally new outcomes to security, drive great outcomes there that we all know and love, but begin to become an asset for the rest of the organization, right? Where all of these computer vision use cases across the organization can begin to come to life. And to begin to talk about it that way, that it is a, it is a sensor, the camera is a sensor producing visual data and thinking about visual intelligence as an organizational capability that can create tremendous competitive advantage in the marketplace. So I think that's something that we can all, I can do better for sure. You know, the one thing that I, that I would recommend thinking about is what is the, what is the disruption 
that could potentially be brought to your business or to your marketplace by the, this new technology that could, quite frankly, could, could ruin your business. It could, it could put you at a real disadvantage, be a real threat to you. And, um, and I'll go back to the retail environment. I don't, I don't think that the standard bricks and mortar retailers were ready for the, uh, for the online retailers. And they got, a, they got a jump on this. And now, you know, you, you heard from both Jim and Eric talking about Omnichannel, that idea that, you know, maybe, you know, Home Depot maybe has an advantage over Amazon in that I can go to the store. And if I have a good digital experience, meaning I can get the information on my phone or via web browser, I can interface with them any way I want to. And, and if they just have to get that right. And so if I look at those, those online retailers, I think a lot of them that, that were susceptible to, to the online space really struggled early. Um, and um, and I, I would just say that's a, that's a lesson for others to learn that if we don't embrace this and we don't go down that path, there's gonna be somebody out there that will, and they're gonna, they're gonna take your customers uh, with them for the ride. And it's interesting, I would actually strongly suggest, because it's you know, the, the, the range of things that could be disruptive in a, in, in a given company's industry and with their competitive set, there, there's a lot of complexity that goes much broader than just that industry. So actually setting up a team that includes outside experts to think about you know, what actually could be done. If I were trying to disrupt this business model, how would I do it? How would I start my own company? Mm -hmm. How would I rain, you know, raise venture funding? Um, and, and then if it's going to happen or it could happen, let's make sure we actually do it ourselves and set it up uh, for, uh, for success. Uh, and I'd strongly encourage every company to kind of go through that exercise. And I, personally, I think the security world within organizations is going to be a gold mine of data that can unlock transformation way beyond uh, kind of the current uh, focus and use cases, which is critically important. Uh, but I think it's going to be much, much, much broader. Well, we could have this conversation, I think, <laughs> for the rest of the afternoon. Um, but we are kind of coming to time here. So I just want to thank you, Mike and Eric and Jim, for taking the hour today to have this conversation. Um, you know, folks, there's a lot of other great sessions um, through today and tomorrow at Convergence Insight Summit. So please join those sessions. And, and thanks so much for your time this afternoon. And thanks to our panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Thank you.